Here. You couldn't hear me before? No. Oh. So we can now, for sure. I let everybody talk later. Sure. Oh. Are those not working? Yeah. Yeah. I could just use them for a little. I guess so. I will turn my volume down. Oh, here we go. There is a cord in the frame. Is it this one? Uh, Michael. Oh, yeah, it is. is it, which one? The yeah. front one or the back one? That one. <laughs> no. Which one? The one you're holding. This one? Here, let me get tape and we can just tape it up. <laughs> JK, it is this one. Do we need tape? Uh, I'm just going to do that. Oh, whoa, whoa. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. We got sound, we got water, we got brushes, we got paint, we got reference, we got steps. I think we have everything that we need. Okay. Michael, can you hear that candy wrapper sound a lot? <laughs> okay, I think I might just open those up and put them on the... That is me wearing an in and out shirt, and I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, girls, try not to play with wrappers, loud wrappers, okay? Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, what time is it, my dear? It's time, 7.17. Oh my gosh, oh, Whew, that was, we were running late. Okay, welcome everybody to Let's Make Art. Thank you so much for being here tonight and painting with us. We have a full house, so I'm gonna introduce everybody. I'm Sarah Cray, hello. And we have all the way, I have Emily here. She's visiting from Alabama. She's visiting Taylor, who works for us. She does great. She works in, you do a lot of things. Lot of things. <laughs> the most important is she now corrects the step outs. So all of my grammar she, <laughs> she corrects, which is really great because I'm not good at that. And we have Beth right here who's visiting from Indiana. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And um, Keenan is out of town actually, so my husband Michael is working the cameras. Hello. So he'll be talking. And because my husband is here, and we have children. My children are also here. Do you want to come say hi? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Luna, you're gonna Luna, Luna, wait. Luna, Luna, wait. Luna, take off the headphones. <laughs> she okay. almost pulled my phone onto the concrete. You can say board. hi. Hi. This is Ella. You've probably seen her before on a live. And this is Luna. Luna, look at the camera and say hi. Hey. Hi. Okay, good job. Now you guys can go sit back down. And then uh, Taylor's husband Kyle is also hanging out so welcome we just it's a big party here um so today we are painting our sunset power lines please ooh and ah at the beauty that we will be making thank you yes <laughs> so um this is a fun project it's our first one out of the august box so that's pretty exciting um we are using four colors tonight so we are using um, deep yellow and tiger orange, and they are very similar in color. The yellow is a little bit lighter, the orange is a little bit darker. And our berry top blue, top. what's wrong? Um, our top camera just died. Oh, so I will keep on going. You just talk to the phone. Okay, great. And then our last color is pink. So those are the four colors. We have pink, 
berry blue, and berry blue is kind of like a purpley blue. So um, that's the color we're looking for. And then yellow and orange, so those four. We also, if you have our, if you have our August Fox, um, there's also magenta in there, which is a great, really saturated, like the pink is a very light value color in nature. So you're not gonna get a super saturated color because that's not how this color works. But if you wanted like a super strong bright pink, then you can grab some magenta from the box and use that and that'll work great. Okay, we're using two brushes. We're using a round six and a round two. These are our go-to brushes. We always use these brushes. They're fabulous brushes. I also gave us some washes. So this is a wash brush, it's more square. And it's just really easy to do um, like even washes in a short amount of time quickly because it's so big. So uh, we sell those all on our website, letsmakeart.com if you don't have any of them. And we are gonna do this project in four steps. So our very first step, we are going to tape it off, okay? Our second step, we are going to do color transitions. Um, I did them square by square, and the reason why I did them square by square is because usually when you're transitioning in color, you want to work fairly quickly. And so if I just did all the blue at once, and then went and then did the pink, there is a good chance that my blue would have dried and create hard lines before I could put in the pink and so forth for all the colors. So that's why I did it section by section. Of course, you can do whatever you want. So if you feel better about doing them all at once, you can absolutely do that. Um, step three, we're going to do our telephone poles and the wires. And then the very last step, we're going to put in our birds. So just those four steps. Um, now, what we are going to do is we are going to... <laughs> we're, we're probably going to have a lot of background noise for my kids, but I think they've been doing okay so far. She doesn't even know she's making noise. She has headphones on. <laughs> That's my four-year-old. She's making a lot of noise she doesn't know. She's doing good. <laughs> she's just... She's living her best life with chocolate and headphones and <laughs> her Barbie dream house show. Okay. Um, I'm going to do our oath before we do our warm-ups. So, I need everybody to raise their right hand and repeat after me. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise, I promise to be kind, kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise, I promise not, not to compare, compare my work. work. And I promise to have fun. And I, and I promise, promise to have fun. fun. Thank you so much. I love starting off that way because sometimes a piece of paper can be really intimidating and especially if you're doing it sometimes new and you're just staring at it and you're like, I'm afraid I'm going to mess this up. You know, let's just acknowledge that it's okay and we're all learning and we're all in different steps. Okay? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to do my warm-ups. So the first thing I'm going to do is let's practice our thin lines. So if you look in our painting here. We have thin lines that connect our wires to each other, okay? So, but it takes a lot of practice to get those really thin lines. So don't get frustrated with yourself if you need um, to slow down and really like practice these lines because they're hard to do. Um, so, my glasses yeah. <laughs> so how I like to do it is I get my brush damp and then I hit the actual bristles off the side of the cup. Um, because if you go straight from paint or water to your paper without hitting your bristles off too much water on your paintbrush so we want to just have like a good amount um, so after I get that I'm gonna grab some color it doesn't matter it's whatever color you want so I load my paintbrush with the paint hey Michael can you move the picture in picture I am okay he's gonna move that picture in picture for you guys so, and then after I fill my brush, I like to actually flatten my brush tip against the palette and then on the other side too. So I'm essentially squeezing my bristles together into a point, okay? Yep, and then now I'm ready to do my thin lines. So, when you do thin lines, you wanna do a vertical hold. So then it's just the tip of your paintbrush hitting that paper. And then you wanna do really light pressure. 
and we can just start with straight and then we'll work on curved. Now, when you're doing these, you'll notice that I'm not resting my wrist. If I rest my wrist and put all of the weight on my wrist, I'm very limited in how far my lines can go, okay? Because it only will go as far as your wrist joint will allow. However, if I keep it so the weight is actually more in my elbow or my shoulder, then I can make my line as long and thin as I need it to be. I can go forever, okay? And especially with this project, because we're doing lines across the entire paper, it's important to be able, I want you to really practice going the entire length with your thin lines, because that's essentially what we're gonna be doing. Sweet Lorraine, we had a question. Yeah. Um, someone has yellow paint, has chunks in the paint. Oh, I yes. I said to give her a shake, she said she did, she did, chunks still exist. Yeah, so I asked our mixers about that. He said that sometimes the separation will occur a little bit. You, you can shake it. Sometimes it won't mix up all the way, but it shouldn't affect the color or how the paint works on the paper. So it's just one of those things. I've talked to them about it, and we're going to see if we can get rid of the chunks, but it doesn't affect the color saturation. It doesn't affect how that paint moves, so you should still be okay. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Okay, so yeah, just keep going with those thin lines. Now, if you're ready, let's see if we can throw a little bit of curve in there, right? So I did my straight lines, and now I'm gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna pretend this is a pole and this is a pole. So then I'm just gonna like practice going from one pole to the other with the curved line. Now you'll notice that sometimes because I'm doing really light pressure, my paintbrush might lift up and create these spaces. I don't worry about those. I'm, I don't try and go back and complete that line um, because it's actually really, really hard to do that with it still feeling like one line. So if I try to go back here and like fill these spaces, the line won't be even. And if anything, that's more distracting to me than those little gaps. So I just let that go. And honestly, when you're looking at really thin um, lines out in the world, sometimes our brain is telling us that there is a complete line, but sometimes we actually don't see the full complete line. And you have to think of it in the way as the sun is hitting it. Think of it as spider webs, right? Usually you can't see spider webs until the light hits some of it and then you're only seeing some of it. It's true like that with really thin lines out in nature also. So that's why I also don't stress about it because I'm like, hmm, maybe that's just the light hitting it weird, you know? Very nice, very, very nice. Um, but this, and it, this is also kind of the scary part. I remember even when I was filming this tutorial when it was time to add the wires and the poles, I was like, okay. But that's okay. We can do hard things and we can do scary things. Also, it's totally okay to turn your paper. It's way easier for me. It's way easier for me to do uh, thin lines horizontally. So that's why I kind of will like kind of angle it, but for the most part, keep it like this. Some people do a much better job doing them vertically, pulling from the top or pulling from the bottom. It doesn't matter. There's no wrong way. So don't feel like you can't turn your paper around because you absolutely can. Just whatever's more comfortable. Okay. So, and I just want to demonstrate some, and again, thin lines are really, really hard. So I just want to show you, if I get my paintbrush wet and I don't dry it off and I fill it up with paint and I don't squeeze it off and I push hard, that's how thick my lines can be, okay? So it just takes a little bit of practice of, of finesse to just, to not have too much on your brush and to really train your hand to be barely touching those bristles to that paper, okay? But because these are rounds, if you press hard, you're gonna get the full belly of the brush, which means that you can get a really wide thing. This is also, um, if I do a horizontal hold and try to do a thin line, it's gonna be thicker because I'm using more of the bristles than just the tip, okay? 
if it if you feel better about drawing these wires before you paint them or the telephone poles in before you paint them you can absolutely draw them out first and then paint them nothing wrong with that okay now the next thing we are going to practice is our color transitions so i'm just going to flip this paper over there are two sides to watercolor paper um, the side that I usually paint on is the side that is slightly more textured, but I've painted on the back before and it was totally fine. And since they're warm ups, I paint on the back of papers all the time. Okay, so I'm going to practice a color transition from pink to um, yellow. Okay, so when you're doing color transitions, there's gonna be part of the area that you're gonna to wanna to keep pure color, okay? So like if you're looking at our pink, this is our pure color pink, okay? And then there's an area where the pink and the orange blend, and you get this kind of like sherbet color, and then it goes into the pure orange and yellow, okay? So you just have to think of it in that way where you want to make sure that even though you're blending in the middle, you're still gonna have those pure colors from both sides. So how I like to do that is I'm gonna get my brush wet, hit it off the side of the cup so not too much water. I'm gonna grab some pink and I'm gonna put some pink down, okay? Now this first part that I'm putting down, I'm gonna call this my pure pink, okay? This is where I'm like, nothing is touching this pink, this pink is gonna stay this color pink, okay? And then I like to dip my paintbrush once or twice hit it off the side, I'm not grabbing any more paint, but I'm just extending the pink to a lighter pink, okay? And it's this area where I'm adding the water and it's a lighter pink that I will transition my orange into that area, okay? So I have my, my, my pure pink, I have the lighter pink that starts to transition light, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some orange, And so there's one or two ways you can do it. You can start off right where it starts to transition. So right where that pink stops, that's where I'm gonna put my orange and go back in and start to blend it. Now, what this is where it gets tricky because if I'm not controlling it, I could potentially bring this orange all the way up to the top. But I wanna make sure there's an area of pure pink. So as I'm blending into this, I'm only gonna go I'm not gonna go all the way into my pink because I wanna keep some of that pink pure, okay? Yep, yeah, very nice. And so sometimes you might have to lift color up. So for example, if you're like, but I just have so much orange and when I try and drag it, there's so much, it's not lightening, it's not blending. You can lift color up in watercolor. So let's say that I have this really strong orange here and there's a really strong line between the orange and the pink, right? Which is usually what we don't want. We want there, we don't want a strong line of definition of where things start to transfer. So what I can do is right here, what I would go in just with my damp brush, there's no paint on it, I would just lift, okay? And then I would lift, okay? And then from there, I would just add more pink into this area and help that transition to the orange. So don't be afraid to lift color. Don't be afraid to say, you know, I can go back in. If, you, if, if the transition's not smooth and you wanna like add more pink to help the transition, you absolutely can. Um, Ashley said, do you get your brush wet first before blending? Yes. So you want to make sure your brush is always damp with watercolor. That's pretty. That's like sherbet ice cream. <laughs> okay, so we're going to practice the same thing, but let's do it with the blue and the pink. Okay, so I'm going to start off with the blue. And this is my pure blue. And then I'm going to wet my brush and start to tra transition to a lighter blue. So we're having like a value transition within this color. And a value transition is just the lightness and darkness of a color. Okay. 
And then how I actually like to do it, so what I did the last time is I started off right where I left off, but what I actually like to do is if I'm going with pink, I like to give myself a little bit of space and be like, okay, here's my pure pink. And then I dampen my brush and use the damp and the lighter part to transition to the blue. Like that. And this is where working quickly is good, right? Because I waited a minute. I have a hard line on my blue where you try, oh, you did that great, beautiful. Very nice, how are you doing? Yeah, you're doing good. But this is a good example of if you wait too long for your paint to dry before you start blending, you're gonna get hard lines. And sometimes I get hard lines in my paintings and like here I probably have a little bit of a stronger line. I don't let that bother me because it's like, that's okay, yeah. <laughs> It's a sky, there's so many different things, but um, try and work fast so you can get a smooth color transition. Okay. So, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we wanna practice before we do that. But let's practice birds before we start. So, when you're doing bird silhouettes, this is what you're gonna see a lot, is um, this, it, our V's, okay? This is like typical bird silhouette, whatever, right? This is what you see everywhere. However, birds are not always in that f shape and in that same flight all the time. So, you can do these V's, but I also want my birds to be resting on the wire and not in flight. So when I'm doing my birds, I just have to think, okay, birds have a body, which is round, and they have a little tail, their tail feather points down, and they have a little head or a little beak, so you're just gonna make their top a little bit more round at the top. And sometimes, this is like if the bird is angled, so kind of on the side, so that's how you can see the belly, the head, and the tail. Sometimes with birds, they're directly back to you, which means that they're kind of gonna be more this shape. And that's because the head, like the head is here, and then the body and the tail, but they all look like one shape because they're perfectly back to you. So just kind of practice, think of like, think of birds, think of different ways that they would be sitting on that wire. Maybe they would be sitting next to each other. Maybe they would all be looking in the same direction. Maybe experiment, I mean, there's different kinds of birds. I don't know a lot about birds, but maybe there's a specific kind that have short tail feathers. Maybe there's a spe specific kind that have longer tail feathers. I wonder if I should actually do this bigger. Yeah, I'll paint this bigger because I'm painting kind of small right now. But okay, so if I'm doing my birds, there's gonna be a belly, a tail, and a head, okay? Now you can see that they all run into each other. I'm not doing a circle here and a circle here and a triangle here, right? Because when they're all sitting together, these shapes that we're making will overlap. And so they won't stay separated, they'll overlap to each other. So here's my circle for my head, here's my circle for my body, here's my tail, and then you're gonna blend them all together, right? So this is gonna look a little bit more realistic than this. And then maybe one bird is flying, and so that one, there's the body, and maybe some wing. Oh, that got a little funky. That's okay. Oh, that's like the, the tweet yeah, yeah, yeah. bird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. Okay, so I think we're ready to paint. Are you guys ready to paint on your thing? Yes. Okay, let's uh, do it. 
So I'm gonna put my warm up to the side. I'm gonna grab my final project paper. And I already taped theirs, so I'll just, um, so we didn't have to spend a lot of time taping. <laughs> so uh, I just have scotch blue painter's tape. That's all I'm using. But you can also use Wasi tape. You can use um, masking tape. And then when I'm taping, I wanna make sure I'm pressing down on the edges. Because sometimes if, if you don't press down all the way, then it could lift up and then the, you won't get a clean line. And sometimes if your color is super saturated right at the edge of that tape, it's hard to get a clean line too. So if you're running into that problem, that could be it also. So, I just did all four of my sides so I can have a clean edge. And you can try and make a straight line. It's kind of hard for me to do that. There we go. Have you guys tried this project yet? I did. Yes. You did? <laughs> How did it go? It was good. Yeah? It was good. Yeah. yeah. You have it? Oh, look at you guys. Um, I've seen, it's been really fun to see the different things that people are doing. And actually they're, what I really was hoping, and I'm, I'm excited that I saw, is people were switching up their composition with this tape. So tape can be a really fun way where you can, you can split your paintings into three, which is a triptych, or you can just split it into two. Or somebody did tape lines that I think kind of went more like across, which was really cool. So I just want you to know that tape is a really great way to like switch up your composition in your paintings and play with it. Michael, yes, ma do you have any fun facts about power lines? <laughs> uh, I think they're dangerous. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that they use the air as insulation. They usually don't have insulation on them. Okay, cool. That's it, that's all I have. <laughs> so you're better for facts with animals is what you're saying. Because the octopus I, one. I just don't know if there's that much interesting research on power lines. I don't know, Keenan was pretty excited about them when, I was t when, I, when we filmed the tutorial. He at least knew what the top things were called. Diffusers? Insulators. Insulators. Transformers? Transform, I don't know. I've already forgotten. <laughs> So I have a massive fear of birds. So what is oh. your best fact to win me over to birds? <laughs> oh. None. <laughs> they're all bad. <laughs> they're, they're the closest thing I think we have to dinosaurs. Well, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> I think that thing about the birds is like when they all do things together, like they're communicating, but you don't know how, like when they're swooping and swarming, like that's yeah, just not that right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Creepy. <laughs> we can't help you. Yep. <laughs> We're just going to give you more creepy facts. <laughs> okay. So I split it up into three. I used my tape. I made sure my things are down. That was step one. Good job. <laughs> We're already a quarter done with this painting. <laughs> Rebecca says crows can recognize human faces. That's creepy. See what I mean? That's I also, terrifying. yeah, I think crows are very intelligent. They can yeah. solve puzzles. Seriously? Yeah, for cocaine. I think they give them cocaine. <laughs> that's, how they, that's how they get animals to do things. Drugs. They have a cocaine button <laughs> that gets mice and rats to do things. That's so great. Do you guys need any more paint? Or are you good? I think we're good. Okay. Katie says, um, birds can only be on one wire at a time. If they touch two, it can mm -hmm. shock them. Interesting. Okay. So we're going to start with our color transition. So this color transition is going to go from blue to pink to like orange and yellow. Okay, those are our four colors. Again, I would like to say that you have complete freedom. So maybe you don't like these colors. You want to switch them up. You want to do them opposite. You want to throw in some other colors. Feel free to. It is your painting. You can do whatever you want. Sarah, Barbara's intimidated. Make her feel better. Barbara. I just want you to keep in mind that 
it's just a piece of paper. And that's all, it, it's literally one piece of paper. The worst, absolute worst thing that can happen from this is you don't like it, and if you don't like it, you just go, okay, I'm not gonna look at that, and I'm gonna try again, or do a different project. I would like to say some projects come easier to other people, and that's totally normal. You're not gonna hit every single project out of the park. The, everybody has like painting nemesises, right? Like, uh, it's really, I'm actually not great at landscapes. I consider that one of my painting subject nemesis. But I feel really good about animals and flowers. So it's okay. If you have things that you are better at doing than others, totally normal. So now um, here with the wash, before we get started, um, you can use your round six if you want. Um, or if you wanted to use a wash, I will show how to use that also. Very similar, except it's a flat, um, wide space than the round, so it just makes it sometimes easier to do flat washes. So I think I actually used one in the pre-recorded too. Maybe I'll do the, I'll switch it up. I'll do one wash, one round, and then a wash. Okay. I did watch a video about a man who fed crows. He yeah. would like, he made a specific crow feeder, yeah. and the crows started bringing him gifts. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. I like the fact that they had homing pigeons where you can send messages. That's cool. Yeah, that is cool. That's really cool. I think birds have some sort of electromagnetic sensor in their head and they can sense direction like a compass. A lot of them like will return to the same place to, to nest and stuff. Yeah. Cool. Like herons do that. They're just okay. too awesome. intelligent for their own good. <laughs> I mean, it's just a do you know who's too intelligent for their own good? Octopuses. Really? If you're Not afraid of anything, yeah. be afraid of octopuses. Yeah. They're going to take over the world. <laughs> Kyle so says smart. crows avoid spots where other crows have died. Ew. Really? Oh. Fascinating. Oh. Also, they can write. They can write? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you do that to me? <laughs> <laughs> me and Taylor are like, they're writing us right now. Okay, focus. We're going to get back to this painting. Okay, so um, I'm going to dip my paintbrush. And I'm gonna start with my strong color. So um, if you wanna wet the area first before you put your color down, you can. If you wanna do it simultaneously, I'll do one of each. So this one I won't wet it first. I'll just grab my paint. Sarah, I know I'm interrupting so much, but this is a good question. Okay. Someone is not sure exactly how to wipe your brush off when you dip it in the cup. Can you bring it on top of yeah. your paper? Yeah. And show them? Can they see this? Uh, come a little to your left. Right there. Okay. okay. Give it a dip. So I dip my paintbrush. I hit it off the inside of my cup, actually hitting the bristles on the edge. So now I have my point, but it is damp, but it's not soaking wet. If I just dip my brush and not hit it off the side, you can see that it's dripping and that it's filled with water. Okay. So if I try and straight to paint that, then I would probably be dripping and I might start getting pools on my paper of water, which we usually don't want. Now there are exceptions. For example, if I'm trying to wet an area, like a big area and work really quickly, then I might just go like wash, 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 and not worry about drying my brush because I want to get my paper wet, but that will be a different instance. So I'm actually hitting my bristles off the so side of the cup. Slower though, like dip and slow. Dip, dip hit. And slow. There you go. And I actually, you can leave it on one side. I have a tendency to twirl my brush and do it, so I'm getting both sides. I don't know if that's actually more effective. Maybe it's more OCD than it like has to be even. I don't know. Okay, good? Good. Okay, great. So, same with my wash. If I dip it, I'm gonna hit it off the side of the cup. I'm gonna grab some paint. So I'm gonna start with my pure blue. Okay, this is my pure blue color. Whoosh. And now I'm gonna dip my brush to my light blue. <laughs> now you wanna make sure you rinse your brush pretty thoroughly in between. And if you wanna like work it back and forth a little bit for a smoother transition, you can. Okay. Very nice, and now I'm gonna get my pink. 
So I'm grabbing my pink. I'm leaving myself a little bit of space. This is my pure pink here. Okay, so this is my pure pink. I know nothing is touching this pink, right? And now I have a space between my pure pink and then when it starts to transition into my blue, and I'm gonna start moving that color up into my blue. But I'm not gonna go all the way down because I wanna make sure some of my pink stays pure pink. Very nice. Rebecca says crows can divide by zero. <laughs> she said they're amazing animals. You can't divide by zero. No one can. It's not a thing. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Listen, I'm good at math. I understand. Can they use a slide rule? Also, they've been known to use band saws to make handsome picture frames. Wait, say that again. Crows have been known to use band saws to make handsome picture frames. They're amazing. Uh, who's this person? This is Mary Beth. Messing. Mary Beth, you're really great. <laughs> okay, I went in and actually darkened my blue a little bit because I felt like it was too light. You have the right to do that. Okay? So, okay, I have my pure pink, right? Now, now I'm going to, similar to what I did with my blue, after my pure pink, I'm gonna lighten my pink. So essentially the rhythm you're looking for is it's gonna be a light version of the color, a light value, then a dark value where the color is pure, and then transition to a light value again where that will go into the next color you're changing into, okay? Mary's curious why you don't just swoop the entire page since they all kind of have the same graduation. Yes, so the reason why I'm not working on all three simultaneously which, if you can paint quickly, I would suggest that you do. However, um, it takes a lot of practice to feel comfortable painting quickly, and I don't want to make fe people feel overwhelmed. And when, if you are trying to do color transitions and you wait too long between the color transitions, you'll get hard lines, and the colors won't transition as nice. So I'm doing it section by section instead of doing it all three at once, because then I would be working extremely fast, and that could be very overwhelming for some people. So I'm just gonna do it section by section. Okay, so I have my pure pink, I have my light pink, now I'm gonna introduce my orange. I'm gonna leave a little bit of space, here's my pure orange, okay? And then I'm wiping off the excess paint. After I put in my pure color and I go into my transition color, I don't want my brush to be too heavy with color or else it would make the transition go like way too up high. So I'm wiping off the excess paint and then I'm going to start moving that yellow up into the pink. I have Sorry. Yes, you okay. can ask. So this one or this one? This is orange? I'm doing, the orange is going to be darker. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Okay, I can't see I that can, one. <laughs> <laughs> and then after I do my orange, I kind of spread this out pretty wide. Um, I don't have a lot of room for my yellow. I'm just going to add it at the end. If you don't have a lot of room for one of the colors, don't stress. Okay, so that is looking pretty good. I am noticing that on my pink, I have a little bit harder lines than I intend to. And that was probably because I stopped and talked a lot. But you can go in and add a little bit of color. So if I want a better transition from my pink to my yellow here, I feel like my yellow transition is nice, but it doesn't blend nicely into my pink. So I can grab a little bit of pink and add that into my yellow. Now I'm not gonna transition all the way because I still wanna keep some of the pink pure, but you can introduce a little bit of color if the lines are too hard for you. I would like to say that this could possibly create blooms in your painting. Blooms are when you're gonna get kind of, blooms happen when you have different areas drying at different times because the water place, like the water disperses differently, for example, um, here's a bloom right here. You see this kind of line right here? I don't get mad at blooms. I actually really like them. I think they create really cool accidental elements in your painting. They don't bother me, but just so you know, if you're gonna keep layering on top of something like this, they're gonna be different drying times, which means you're gonna get some blooms. I just tend to embrace them instead of like be mad at myself all the time, you know? Blooms happen. Blooms happen. And actually, Canton paper especially 
um, I've noticed tends to bloom more than other paper. So if you hate, if you're the person that just hates bloom so much, um, I would suggest using a different type of paper. Stonehenge paper is great. Arches watercolor paper is great, but you would want a heavier weight paper that's 100% cotton. It takes a lot longer to dry, which means um, it, it will even out way easier. Okay. Rebecca Crow Benfield says that Beautiful. when she did this project, the colors ran a bit along the inside edges of the frames. Is that normal? Yeah, mine's doing that too. Okay. So you can see here that my pink is actually traveling up a lot more on the sides. I think it's probably because I'm painting all the way across and because there's tape there, the paint is gathering along the edges and then it's traveling up the side because it's wet. That happened to mine too. I think it might even be in the reference photo. If you guys have it here, you'll see my yellow actually bleeds up the sides. I just was okay with it. Okay, so we did one. Now we're gonna move on to the next one, okay? So this one, I'm gonna put just water down first. Sometimes if you put water down first, the colors will tend to even out and transition um, smoother because the area is already wet so the color will just move um, but I do think it takes a little bit more practice to control that so you can do whatever way you want so um, I'm gonna start with actually yeah I'm gonna start just using water across the top half okay so it's just damp then I'm gonna grab my blue and I'm gonna put blue on the top so I'm grabbing my blue, here's my true blue, like my, my dark, my pure blue, right? And then I'm gonna get rid of the excess paint on my brush and transition that blue down. While y'all were away, Sarah and I had our 10-year anniversary. We did. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. We've been married 10 years, Michael. What the heck? Time flies. Time does fly. Okay. Now, still working very quickly. I'm going to start into my pink. I'm leaving a little bit of space. I'm going to grab some pink paint. I love that texture you got right there. Thank you. That kind of like, it almost is like bleeding up into the top. I think that's so beautiful. Okay, grabbing my pink. Here's my pure pink. I'm trying to get it to match up to the one next to it. If it doesn't line up exactly, don't be too hard on yourself. Here's my pure pink. I'm going to get rid of the excess color and start blending that pink up into the blue. Okay. Rachel's curious of your brush brand and where you buy them. Uh, yeah, we use Princeton Heritage Series brushes. Um, this actually is a brush I'm testing for a different company. I don't want to say the name yet because I'm testing it. <laughs> but um, so the ones that we carry will have a handle more like this, like an acrylic handle. But they're Princeton 4050 Series Heritage. That's the same line as our rounds. They're fabulous brushes. You can get them at letsmakeart.com. Okay. Stacy says happy 10. Thank you, Stacy. Okay, so then I got my pure pink and I'm starting to transition into my light pink, right? If you want to go in and darken any of the areas, you have the power to do that. Okay, and then I'm going to grab my orange. There's my pure orange. Rinse and wipe off the excess color. Use light orange to transition into the pink. Out. That one I don't even need to add yellow. It's because I'm using such a bigger brush that I'm running into this. Where this last one I'll use a round. Very nice, very nice. How are you doing over there? Oh, that looks good. Oh my gosh, I love that right there. Thank 
points. It wasn't on purpose. <laughs> so I'm gonna roll with it. <laughs> that is why watercolor is so amazing. And you'll notice too, I didn't tape my paper down on the paper so I could, uh, on the table I mean, so I can move it. Um, but at this point you're gonna notice that your paper is starting to bend and buckle a little bit. That's because we're putting a lot of water and a lot of paint on this paper. Um, again, so the paper that we're using is 140 pound cold press Canson paper. Okay, which I actually like. The biggest reason why I like it, honestly, and I use it in my personal work, is affordability. I hate having a piece of paper in front of me that was like $3 because then I'm like, have pressure on myself to not mess up. And I just, I don't wanna have to put pressure on myself when I don't have to. And I think it does a pretty decent job of holding up. If you are somebody who is really heavy with water and paint and you are having a really hard time with your paper buckling a lot, use a heavier weight, paper, there's 300 pound watercolor paper, and also make sure it's 100% cotton. This paper isn't 100% cotton, so like Arches has 140 pound, 100% cotton paper that um, will hold up better to a lot of water and a lot of paint. Okay? Tiffany. Tiffany wants to know if you're using a cool cup and a warm cup, or if it's just coincidence. Yeah, I actually um, am using two different cups right now. Um, I'm using this blue one for my blue pink and then yes this one for my yellow orange um, because if you mix blue and the orange or yellow together it will turn brown so I'm just trying to separate that just in the areas especially when you have light washes like this the color of your water matters so I kind of separated it or usually I'll have um, like one will be just fine. Like if your water looks like this, it won't affect it too much. You should be okay. So it just depends also how heavy you are being with your paint. Oh, um, let me answer this before we start on the, the next question. Carolyn asked, she's seen hot press paper. Um, hot press paper, so cold press or toothy rough watercolor paper has a texture to it. It's very bumpy, it's uneven, okay? Um, hot press paper is smooth. It's completely smooth, you won't have that texture. However, what I've noticed with hot press paper is it's extremely hard to get an even wash. Like once you put your first brush stroke down, that stroke stays there. So for me, I tend to gravitate towards the cold press because the workability is easier. However, if you're trying to get really smooth washes, like for example, when I did wedding invitations and I wanted a watercolor wash that was smooth and was easy to scan in because hot press paper is much better for scanning than cold press, I would use the hot press paper because I could get a nice even wash if I worked quickly um, and it didn't have a texture so it made it easier to scan. So. That's the difference. Try some hot press, um, but for me in my personal work, I very rarely use hot press because it does take a lot of practice to get a smooth transition and not get hard lines in them. So that's the difference. Okay. Sorry, that was a lot of talking. Let's move on to the third. And also you guys don't have to wait for me. If you wanna move on to the third, you absolutely can. Um, I'm gonna to switch to my round for this area. Honestly, if I were to do it over, I probably would have done a round in the smaller area because if you have bigger areas, bigger, bigger brushes make it easier, but you can absolutely do this with a round six. And I'm going to just go for it. I'm gonna get more blue. So get your paintbrush wet, hitting it off the side of the cup. Filling my paintbrush with the paint, working across. Now I'm gonna add water to start getting a lighter transition. And you can see here how sometimes ha having a bigger brush is easier. Cause I just did probably four or five brush strokes to get that, where with this big wash brush, I would have only had to do one. So if you've noticed that you're seeing yourself doing a lot of um, washes. If you're doing landscapes, I highly recommend getting a flat or a wash brush. It just makes it so much easier on you. Okay, and I'm transitioning down. 
Heidi asks if the kids are okay. <laughs> I'm already typing her a response. <laughs> They're perfect. They're doing good. Luna just got caught up in a chair for a second. And they're wearing headphones, so I don't think they know when they're making noise. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to grab. Very nice, beautiful transition. I'm going to grab some more pink. Now I have noticed with this blue, I am getting a little bit of a grainy texture. Sometimes that depend, depends on the batch of paint that you have. I've noticed it with other liquid watercolors um, too. Um, that I just, I just look at that as just a cool texture that I wasn't planning, but it creates some interest in my painting, so that's okay. So if it's happening to you, it's probably the paint and it's not you, so don't get mad at yourself. Okay, I have my pure pink. I'm switching down to a lighter pink. I'm gonna grab my orange. Here's my pure orange. Transitioning to my pink. I'm gonna do another layer of pink just so that transition is a little bit better. Again, try and be careful. If you have blue on your paintbrush and you grab yellow, it's gonna turn a muddy color. So try and rinse your brush very well when you're going from color to color. And then now I can, now I have room for the yellow. Sarah, in your yeah. opinion, which state has the prettiest sunsets? Oh, in my opinion, which state has the prettiest sunset? The prettiest sunset I've seen has been, have been here in Missouri. I think a lot of that has to do with where we're at, though. We're kind of in the country where it's just sky and field. Um, my mother, who lives in Arizona, would firmly say Arizona has the prettiest sunsets. I was going to say Arizona. And yeah. you know I don't like talking positively about it, because <laughs> I think Phoenix is a tribute to man's arrogance. <laughs> but Arizona sunsets are beautiful. Yeah. I think I probably noticed the most in Missouri, though. Okay, here's a bloom. Right there. And I'm going to leave that, actually, because I think that's a really cool line and no it's not smooth and no it doesn't match my color transition but I'm gonna go with it because I think it's actually pretty cool oh Pat says Hawaii oh actually ooh, it, yeah I don't know if you can even compare like I don't feel like it's fair to throw like the Azores. You can, yeah, like don't count. tropical places in there. <laughs> they said the Arizona sunsets are pretty because of pollution. Oh, hmm. well, maybe actually. Yeah. I've heard that's true. I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't notice that in China though. That the sunsets were prettier because of the pollution? Right. Yeah. You don't even see it. Can you see the sun in China? Not always. Is this smog that bad? People are saying here Michigan's pretty good. I've never been to Michigan. Okay. Um, we're waiting for our last section to dry, but my first section is pretty dry, so I can put in my telephone pole. So there's a couple ways that you can put in your telephone pole. First, Make sure your paper is dry before you do these detail lines. As you have probably noticed while you're painting, if an area is wet and you drop paint in, the paint will diffuse and spread out. And these telephone poles and wires and birds, we want them to be sharp. So you wanna make sure that your painting is dry underneath. This one is not dry yet. This one is dry. So I can work on this while that dries. And to see if it's dry, I honestly just touch it. I don't know if you should do that, but that's what I do, and I think that's okay. Um, now, to get this dark color on the poles, I kind of just mixed all the colors together to get kind of like a bluish, just like a dark blue. Um, so I just grabbed some blue, and we have some pink here. Now, when you add the yellow or the orange to the blue, it's going to make it green, just giving you a heads up. So put a little bit in there, but don't go too crazy with it because it will, if, I mean, you can, it will just make it super, super green. So I'm just trying to get like a blue gray. 
So I'm doing mostly blue, pink, a little bit of orange, and now I have this like gray blue color. Uh, if you want to take magenta out from your box, that would actually probably be a really pretty color to add in there and make it like a dark purple, which I think would be pretty. Okay. Now, this part is scary, so it's okay to be scared, but you just kind of take a deep breath and you do it and you just go, you're just a piece of paper. So, if you want to draw in your telephone posts before you put them in and use a ruler so the lines are straight, go for it. I like to just go for it because most of the time I can't find a ruler and I don't like looking for things while I'm painting, so I'll just go for it. Do you ever use a blow dryer to speed up the drying process? Uh, yes, I have used a blow dryer before. The only thing to be aware of is if it's powerful, it will make the paint move. So if you have a heat gun, that would be better. I've used it a couple of times, but most of the time actually this this dries fairly quickly, so it's only when I'm in a real rush do I use a blow dryer. Okay, here we go, telephone post time, okay? So, remember our lines. So what I like to do is I actually like to just do the vertical line first, okay? And it might be a little bit crooked, but I try and do it on the thinner side because if it's thinner, then I can adjust if it's crooked by just thickening different areas. Okay, so I'm gonna do, be like, okay, this is really scary, but you know what, I'm gonna take a deep breath, and I'm just going to put in my line. And I'm gonna go, like, halfway. <laughs> the pressure. I know, <laughs> I know, but I did it kind of thin, so then, after I do it, you're gonna wanna face your paper to you and make sure that your line is actually straight. And if you have found that your line is straight, or not straight, you then make adjustments from there. My line went a little bit to the left, so I'm just going to add a little bit of paint on the left-hand side and try and get an even line. And thicken that up at the bottom. Is that a two or a six, Sarah? This is a six okay. that I'm using. I'm just using my six. No, Taylor, you can use your two. Okay. There's no wrong way. If you feel more comfortable using a thinner brush to get these lines, nothing wrong with that. Um, I feel pretty good about being able to get thin lines with my six, so I'm not gonna stress. I'm gonna square off my top. Okay. Now, when you add your horizontal bar, this one's a little bit tri trickier, because you wanna make sure it's even on both sides. Also, I put my horizontal line closer to the top of the pole. If you put it too low, it's gonna look like a cross. And I think the, the crossbars tend to be pretty high on telephone poles anyway, but that's all I was thinking about when I first made this project, is I was just like, I hope people don't think these are just a bunch of crosses. But actually the wires help a lot to make it look like a telephone pole. Okay, so now, okay, now I'm gonna do the second scary part where I'm going to do my horizontal area. And remember, just try and make them even. Okay, so I feel pretty good about the length on either side. I'm just eyeballing it. A way you can measure if you're not very good at eyeballing it is use the back of your pen, pen or pencil or whatever. You can hold it up and mark it with your finger and then measure the other side and see if that's even. So you can use your little paintbrush tool as a kind of little ruler. And then I'm actually gonna thicken this line just a little bit, now that I feel good about how long it was, and square off the ends. And if it gets a little bit wonky and it's not perfectly even, don't stress out. I for sure have seen some old wonky wooden telephone poles, you know? It's not always perfect. Do you remember in uh, Sao Miguel that they were concrete? Yes. That was kind of cool. Yeah. There's a bunch of different kinds now that are different shaped. I would say these are more traditional. They remind me of country roads, you know? John Denver? <laughs> yeah. And then I'm just going to add the little, uh, what are these called? The little things at the top. 
Insulators. Insulators. Thank you. If you want to use your round two for that, you can because they're a little bit smaller. And I just did a little four. They're just kind of little bumps at the top here. I feel like some of them are round and some of them are not. I don't know. I just kind of did dashes. I think the old ones are glass. My dad has a bunch of them. Yeah, that's what Keenan was saying. He said his mom used to like collect them or sell them or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. I don't know. Missouri hobbies. Okay. There's my first telephone pole. Good job, you guys. That looks great. Thank you. Beautiful. Very nice. Yes. Okay. Now we're moving on to our end. Also, just really quick, I want to show you the benefit of using a wash compared to a round when you're doing even washes. Because my round was smaller and it's not an even tip, I tend to end up getting harder lines easier with my round. Um, so again, if you want to do nice even washes, flats are the way to go. But for simplicity, I just stuck with my round when I initially painted the project because so I don't want to make you guys buy another brush. So you can get even washes with the round, it just takes more time. You just gotta be patient. The plebeians are rioting for a check-in. Oh yeah, okay, let's check in. Okay, let's start with Beth here. So, we have some gorgeous color transitions wow. here. I like that I can tell the difference between your dark values going to light to dark to here. Um, I would say that there might be a little bit of a strong edge just on your pink, um, but it actually doesn't bother me that much. So if it's not bothering you, I wouldn't do anything about it. If it is bothering you, if you are running into this at home, what I would do is I would take a clean brush with some pink and just add a little bit of pink here at the top and transition that a little bit smoother. I think that yellow is actually fine. That doesn't bother me as much as I think the top. And I think your yellow orange transition is beautiful. I think this right here is gorgeous. That right there. And I like how dark your telephone pole is. Very nice and straight and square. Thank you. Beautiful job. The plebeians approve. Taylor. <laughs> uh, Taylor killed it with her color transitions. Um, I'm not seeing many hard lines. Also, Taylor is an artist, so what do you usually work with? Um, color pencil. Color pencil, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're used to the transitioning yeah. and the overlapping and all of that yeah. stuff. I think that's beautiful. I love how saturated your colors are, and I think that's what makes this project really fun, right? Because we can go really light and have a value transition, or you can just go crazy and just have it be super saturated and strong in color. I think both are beautiful. So, and there, it's just whatever you want to do. So I love that. Uh, you've got a nice dark color. You're a little, man, what, what, what are they called again? Insulators. Insulators. <laughs> I want to say diffusers, but I am like, that's not right. <laughs> that's for your hair. <laughs> uh, those look really great. So good job. I'm going to read your costume. Okay. Okay, here, so, oh my gosh. Emily, thank you. <laughs> Emily. Emily insulators. Emily insulators. I can do this. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, so we have some great colors here. Now, um, I would say that the transitions have a little bit of a harder edge to them, but personally, I think it looks really I cool. I like it too. So I think you have some gorgeous textures here where these colors are meeting with the other colors that are so beautiful. So I think this is great. And what's also really amazing about art in general is one, you can make your world however you want it to be. And two, there are clouds that make hard edges. There are hard edges in the sky. So I like, I think this is way cool. I love the textures that you got. Um, if anything, I would square up your post a little bit more. That's the only thing, which is probably the easiest thing to do. Is it okay if I paint on this? Please go so after you make your post and you see that it's kind of not as straight as you want, you can absolutely go back in and just be like, okay, I'm just, I just need to thicken up and straighten up this side and this side and get a smooth edge on that. 
So don't stress if you gotta straighten up your pole. It's not difficult to do. And a little bit more up here. The internet approves of your collective paintings. You guys are doing great. Thank you, internet. Thanks, internet. <laughs> Are you pressing hard? Okay, so when I'm doing, when I'm straightening something up, I'm using a smaller brush. And I am pressing a little bit hard because I'll get a thicker flat line. Like so. Yep, very nice. Okay. <laughs> Nobody's gonna notice that except for you. Okay. So now we're ready to move on to our second telephone pole. So again, I'm mixing my dark colors. Now this pole I made taller. Um, I just wanted to do that. You don't have to do that. You can make them totally even. I just like the idea of like having Compositionally, when something goes across, maybe even a little bit, right? Where it's not a perfectly, because here's the thing. Sorry, I just am doing like four different thoughts at once. When you make strong lines within your painting, your eye is instantly gonna recognize those patterns. So for me, yeah, I can make another telephone pole here, I can make another telephone pole here and do wires straight across, but what that is going to do is my eye is instantly gonna chunk those pieces up. So it doesn't, so they feel almost sectioned off because those implied lines are so strong. So what I kinda like to do to combat that is if you make your telephone pole a little bit taller, your, your wires have to go across and up, which makes your eye go down and across your painting. Does that make sense? So just be aware when you're doing things like this that if everything is the same height and everything is like perfectly spaced in the same height, your brain likes to recognize patterns and it will pick those up and it can be distracting to your painting. If that's what you're trying to do, then success. But if you don't wanna do that, then try and switch up where the top of things align so then you're not accidentally making a bunch of implied lines. Okay, now we're ready. So again, this is really scary and it's hard and it's gonna be a little bit harder because the pole's gonna be taller so you gotta make your line a little bit longer but we can do hard things and it's just a piece of paper. So I'm gonna just do my pole. I'm gonna go a little bit more than halfway, okay? My line feels pretty straight and now I'm just gonna thicken it and square it up. So I did my first line. I'm gonna widen it. Try and make it similar in width to your first one. If it's a little bit bigger, that's okay actually because since this is bigger on the painting, it's technically closer to us. That's how things work when we're doing landscape. When something is big and large, it's closer to us. And when something is smaller and thinner, it's farther away. So if yours is a little bit thicker, that's fine. It's true to what we're seeing, but don't make it like way too thick to where it's like, they don't feel like they belong in the same world. And then I'm gonna do my horizontal line near the top. And this is hard because you got to make sure it's even on both sides, but we can do it, you guys. It's just a piece of paper. So I'm just going to go across. Yep, that's pretty good. I can measure it to see if it's even by using my handle on my paintbrush. Pretty even. Great. Now I'm going to thicken the line. Oh, was yours wet a little bit? It was wet. Okay. I'm just taking a pause here. Yeah, so if yours here, like Beth, hers was a little bit wet, so when she hit it with that pole color, it bled out, but she cleaned it up really nice. Whenever that happens to you, don't freak out. Clean it up as best as you can just by lifting up the color that you don't mm -hmm. need. Wait for it to dry. Once it dries, you can just go in and put in that cross pole and get a clean edge, and you're good to go. Thank you. So you killed it.
in a good way. Uh. <laughs> like nailed it. <laughs> Okay, I did my cross. Might actually make it a little bit longer. Oh, Alyssa said theirs was wet. I am so sorry, don't stress. It's gonna be okay. Again, try and lift up the, the extra color that's bleeding that you don't want it to bleed. Just take a damp brush and lift that up. Wait for it to dry and then go in and redefine the lines. Okay, and then I'm gonna do my insulators. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you laughed, so I wasn't <laughs> sure. I'm like, wait. <laughs> it's like an insulated mug, same concept. Okay, I can, you guys, I can do this. <laughs> okay, there we go. Good job, you guys. We're doing great. You're fine. <laughs> um, I'm ready to add my wires since my poles are done. Now, when you're doing your wires, if, and sometimes this is really helpful to do, and I know it sounds so silly, but just imagining what those lines are gonna look like before you paint them is really helpful. So what we're trying to do is match up the first insulator on the first pole with the first insulator on the second pole. So they're going to match up this way and then the second one to the second, third one to the third, and fourth one to the fourth. Remember, I'm not doing super straight lines. I'm gonna try and do curved lines. Um, some of your lines are gonna have more of a curve than the other, but that is true in what we would see out in the wild too, right? Like some of those wires look a little bit wonky, you know? How are you doing, Michael? Good. You're doing good? <laughs> Just quiet back there trying to manage our children and all the cameras. You're doing a great job. I appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna get my dark color. I just need a bit more of the other color to mix again. Maybe a little bit of orange to get that dark. Okay, now this is where our thin lines come into practice. If you wanna try on your sheet one more time, since it's been a while since we did our warm up, you are free to. I'm just gonna go for it. And here we go. Now I'm turning my paper a little bit, cause if I keep it horizontal, it's your hand, for right handed people, it's, <laughs> it's gonna be in the way. You won't see where your pole ends right? So I'm turning my paper up a little bit so I can see the entire time I'm painting where my cord ends. Okay. And remember, vertical hold, light pressure, move with your elbow or your shoulder and just go for it. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here. Oh, I lift it up. Here's a line. Now, one thing I wanna show you, how this line was going, it wasn't gonna meet this first one perfectly. If I tried to force that curve where it met that first one perfectly, um, I feel like that curve would have been a little bit too extreme. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm just gonna let that go in between the two and not worry about it, okay? So it's okay if things like that happen. Now we're gonna do the second one, ready? And I'm curving my paper so I can see where it's gonna end up. There's my second. Okay. It's at this point in my painting where I start to freak out about messing up. But when you think about actual painters, they all have some like something that defines them. And I just let people pretend that I messed up on purpose. Yeah. Like, they don't know. Yeah, that's my thing. I'm, <laughs> I just paint with too much water on purpose. Yeah. I like really thick wires. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. That's Michael painting. Cray, the thick wire artist. <laughs> His thick wires are so great. <laughs> <laughs> you're a catch. Oh, you're a catch. Okay. And then my last one. Okay. Here we go. Okay. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Looks good. Okay. Very nice. I know that this bled a lot, but man, I love what that what happened there. I think that's really cool. Pull it over. Yeah, it was unexpected, but it's fine. Yeah. So hers bled out a little bit, but I just think that the texture she got right here, even though they're not clean edges, it, it's not distracting to me. I don't know. I'm really drawn to it, actually. Like, what's going on there? Because you're like, I don't know. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on there. And that's okay, because that's sometimes what we see, too. I just also think the color is really beautiful in that area. Okay. And then these wires, of course, continue going off of our paper, even though we don't see the other telephone poles, right? So um, on this first uh, insulator, I'm just going to go across and just do that on all four on both sides. So just imagine that these cords are going somewhere. And same thing. Yeah. All right, we got a hard question, Sarah. Okay. Barb wasn't paying attention. Yeah. And she put a pole in the middle. Okay. Now she's stressing about where her wire should go. Should she oh. just droop, droop? Don't stress about where your wire should go. I think Emily actually did a pole in the middle of hers. So instead of connecting just one to this one, you're just going to connect three of them. Pull so, is over. Okay, can I pull yours over? Okay, so here we have Emily. She has three, which I think is looking really good. So you're just going to keep going with the same thing. This first one is going to hit this first one, which is going to hit this first one, which is going to keep on going. Is it okay if I paint on this? Yeah. So if I'm doing my last one here, so it looks like you did three on yours. Great. So I'm just going to go that third one there, and then this third one is going to match up to that third one. That's it. And it's gonna look it's gonna look totally right, so don't stress. Okay. So we got our wires, we got our poles, we got our color transitions. We just gotta do our birds. Now this is where it gets fun because you can do maybe you don't like birds, like Taylor. Maybe Taylor's <laughs> like, I will never paint a bird in my life, and that's her thing. She can be done. She can maybe do shoes hanging off. You know, you see those tennis mm -hmm. shoes tied. Um, but you can have them any way in this painting. Um, I'm going to probably do most of the birds. And this is where you start to think about composition. There's a lot going on in my first and third area because I have my poles. If you look in my second area, there's not a lot going on. It's just wires. So I'm like, great. I actually have some space to do some extra activity there. So I'm going to put some birds there. And as somebody once said, birds can't be touching two wires at the same time, so I gotta focus. My favorite comment to that comment was someone said, how big of a bird <laughs> would have to be to touch two wires? You just say these birds the stretching giant. out like, I will touch both of them. <laughs> I'm gonna see what happens, I don't know. Some of them are bigger than you think. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, we got freaking vultures around our house and what's the other one? What do you, wait, eat our chicken. Those. Those would be hawks? Yeah, those, though they're big. They're murderous. They just swooped down and punctured one of our chickens and bailed out. Didn't even eat it. Just punctured it. I'm making sure our girls are wearing headphones. Okay, that was a sad day. Now I'm going to add birds. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you got your body of the bird, and they have a tail. And maybe, like, I just did the body and the tail, and I'm like, you know what? I actually like that silhouette. I'm not going to add a head to that because that looks good to me. I don't, I don't, this bird has just turned a little more so you don't see the actual head. That's okay. He's shy. And we got another bird next to him because, you know, birds are friends, I feel. Oh, we also do have bald eagles here because I've seen three or four driving to Chillicothe. Have you really? Yes. There's bald eagle's nests on the way to Chillicothe. We have those at my house as well. That's cool. Yes. Did, have I seen one? Uh, yeah, you've seen at least two. Because we're Here's always together. Fact. I'm like, how can you see it? My zoology see? teacher did yeah. research on red-tailed hawks. Uh -huh. And you know in movies when eagles make that like that sound? Make it. That screechy sound? Sa make it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is not an eagle. That's a red-tailed hawk that they use the sound for, because I guess eagles kind of just cluck like chickens. That's so They're funny. not very intimidating sounding. They want so, them to sound super majestic, so, so they, they steal another sound of a bird? Yeah. 
Oh, the media yeah. always manipulating us. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's real in Birdland anymore. <laughs> if you can't trust the sound of a bald eagle, what can you trust? Oh, that's so funny. Okay, so I got two little birds. Maybe I'll do three. Isn't there a song? I was just thinking three little Bob birds. Marley. Yeah. Bob Marley. Yeah. <laughs> so we got the body, the tail. This one I'll add a little bit of a head on. Can you pull the paper to your left a little bit? There you go. Now just paint there. Okay. Can you see up here? Because I'm going to move into my third section. Or do nope, I... pull it a little more left then. A little more. A little more. All right, there. Okay. So, yeah. My bird is bleeding. <laughs> okay, just give it a second okay. to dry, and then we'll clean it up. Okay. Another reason that can make something bleed is if you're using straight blue, and not mixing in any other colors or water. Sometimes the colors are super concentrated and they will have fuzzy edges a little bit. So that well, could be it. Melissa says, you saw bald eagles driving? I didn't know they could get licenses. <laughs> but um, Thank you, Melissa. That was good, Melissa. <laughs> you need to get like a soundboard in here so you can play that every time you play Yeah. So I would just wait for that for a second and clean up the edge. Okay. It's I'm not. Look at it. And actually mine, if you look closely, mine's bleeding a little bit too. <laughs> just right there, right on the edge. Yeah. Just don't be mad. Okay. Taylor, don't be mad about it. And mix some other colors in there. Taylor, calm down. Taylor. <laughs> Taylor, take <laughs> a breath. It's going to be okay. Okay, I'm going to do a bird flying in this one like it's about to land. So it's going to be like this wing on the left is covering most of its body. Here's the wing on the other side. There we go. You can be like, does that look like a bat? Maybe. But you know what? When bats and birds are flying, can you really tell the difference between them? Yeah, oh. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> what does a bat look like? Bats are like not aerodynamic, so they're just like flapping all the time. Oh, I don't know if I've out. ever seen a bat Fly. I've hit like three or four bats in the car on accident. <laughs> it hurts my heart every time. Well, I say this is still pretty birdy, so I'm okay with it. Bats eat a lot of bugs. They're okay by me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, there were some in Placerville too, weren't there? Oh, yeah. There's bats everywhere. Oh, yeah. One trap. One got trapped in the house that me and your mom had us. <laughs> Johnny swish screamed. Out. Yeah. Right so away. you guys get this. It's me and my mother-in-law and my brother-in-law and a bat gets in the house. Also, time out, he's not a child, he's a grown man. He's a grown man, <laughs> a bat gets in the house, he runs into the bathroom and shuts the door <laughs> and refuses to help and me and Michael's mom has a tennis racket in a pillow blanket just trying to like swoosh it to the door. He was of zero help and he hid the entire time. So Johnny, you let us down that day, but that's okay. If there's a, a bat by a sleeping person, they have to get a rabies shot. A bat by a sleeping person? Like if you wake up and there's a bat in your, your bedroom. Just in case it bit you? Yes, because they're oh. so, so often rabid. It's a oh. public service announcement. Public right service here. announcement. Right if you were apartment. sleeping and you wake up and you see a bat, go get a rabies shot. Call a Please. doctor. Call a doctor. I don't know how <laughs> Call your dad. Call your doctor. You want to get with this, but yeah. if you get to a certain stage of rabies, mm -hmm. you're dead even with all the modern technology. Yes. So you have to get like a rabies shot. I listened to a Radiolab podcast about this doctor who they caught this little girl's rabies too late and she was gonna die. And so they put her in a coma and until she passed rabies and woke up again. And so they, that's the go-to, but it's only worked like three times out exactly. of thousands of cases. Yeah. Does the rabies just go away over time? It burns itself out. Your body burns yeah. it out of you, I guess. I don't know. Rabies, really? is, rabies is terrifying. It makes yes. you so scared of water. Like, if you have rabies, you'll claw your eyes out at the sight of water in the advanced stages of rabies. That is it's horrifying. Terrifying. Yeah. So that's a very serious PSA that we just said. Yeah. If you <laughs> think oh, you might have been <laughs> bitten by yeah, that, like, go to mess, the hospital. Don't mess with rabies. Don't mess with rabies. <laughs> oh, man, that's so intense. Okay. Um, <laughs> focus now on our rabid birds. Like my number one that one's cute. Fear. Rabies? Like rabid raccoons. Oh, like me I'm, when, when oh my dog. I will <laughs> say that after Michael listened to that podcast about rabies, he seriously was terrified. Like 
he was just like, I don't know why more people aren't scared of rabies. It is horrifying. It's horrifying. Right, and then, then to get the rabies shot, you have to go through the, like, the, the public health service. Like, you, you can't just, like, it's not easy to even get the shot. So then you Are have to you deal serious? with the, the health system, yes. Awesome. Which is like probably more terrible than the, the <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, unrightful imprisonment and rabies are my two fears in <laughs> It's life. true. Those are his two huge fears. Okay, I'm going to do another little bird. I just feel like I need more birds. I'm going to have one sitting over here. October has to have a bat in the box. Oh, oh, listen, October is already done and there is not a bat in the box, but I still love you guys. <laughs> it's just going to be a list of all the diseases that are really terrible. They're loving our light painting conversations that we're having right now. <laughs> I know when you started talking about clawing your eyes out, I'm like, there are children that watch the show. <laughs> children that will be afraid of rabies as they rightfully should. As they as rightfully, rightfully should. should. This is called education. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Don't mess with that. So to clean this bird up, how do I do that yeah. without affecting my sky? Or do I just not? <laughs> okay, so Taylor here got a little bit of a fuzzy bird because she was using just that berry blue that kind of bled out a little bit. So I told her to leave it. Now, there's two things that you can do. One is you just let it go and you don't care about it. Two, you can't erase fuzzy tiny little lines like this in mm -hmm. watercolor. What you can do is you can go back through with your round two and sharpen up the edges. Okay. But when you do that, it will make your bird bigger. Right. So you just have to think, okay, if I make my bird bigger, then how does that relate to the <laughs> other birds that I have going on in my painting? If it makes it too big that it will stand out, I would leave it. So you think I should leave it? Because that one's already kind of fat. I would leave it. <laughs> okay. I feel like if you made this too much bigger, you would have to then go and make all yeah. your other birds bigger, which is probably, it's not a bad thing. I mean, birds are very, yeah. very in size. But what you don't want to do is sometimes when we get caught up in doing this, we want to fix something so bad that we end up making it more noticeable yeah. than if we would have just left it in the first place. So if you can live with it, I would live with it. I just wouldn't touch it. Because honestly, I, with the different wires going on, I can't even really tell that that's fuzzy or bleeding. From a distance. Yeah. Also, all paintings look better from a distance. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> okay, so... Um, now we're going to take off our tape and I'll show you guys how to do that. So when you take off your tape, you want to do it slowly and gently. If you just try and rip it off like a band-aid, you might rip your paper. Stop. So. Go yeah. up and to your left a bit. Better? There. Yeah. No, okay. Please. So I'm peeling away my sections first because that's the last piece of tape that I put on were the middle sections. And I'm just going to slowly and carefully lift. Uh, a few minutes ago, Luna just came over and whispered very loud by my microphone that she wants more chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay. So, I got my clean edge. I can see at the top here that it bled out a little bit underneath my tape. That's That sometimes happens. I honestly have not figured out exactly why. I think it has to do with the amount of paint and water that are near that tape's edge when you're painting, but sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't happen at all. I, I'm sorry that I don't have more information for you. I think it, because I used way more paint over here and it bled the most over here. Yeah, I think it is probably how much paint you're, you're using. And then when you get to the ones that are, now this one's a little bit tricky because it's in the middle and you have paint on either side of your tape. But when you get to the, the edge edge ones, you're gonna wanna pull away from your painting. So for example, I'm gonna start on this corner. So I'm pulling away peeling away from my painting. And the reason why you want to peel away from your painting is if you're peeling towards your painting and the tape happens to snag your paper and it starts to rip, it will rip into your painting. But if you're pulling away, it would not rip into the painting, just around the painting, which is better than actually ripping your painting.
I bet that tape just has a hard time adhering to such like a porous surface. Yeah, I think it's probably how textured the, the surface is that makes that kind of bleed through a little bit. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so there I got a little bit of rip on my paper, but it's just a tiny bit. And now you have to deal with all these rolls of tape. I'm almost done. Um, a little thing about paint brushes. Don't leave your paint brushes in your water. Um, if you guys notice that when I'm not using my brushes, they stay on my paper towel. I don't leave them in my water cup and that's because the, the water will shape the bristles, especially with your smaller brushes, like your round two. If you leave that in a cup of water, it will curve the bristles and they won't be that point anymore. So there's ways that you can reshape your brushes. If that happens to you, you can get like a brush conditioner or a brush soap, soap and reshape them. But for the most part, for my brushes, when I'm done using them or just not using them, I rinse the paint off of them, hit them off the side of my cup, and just leave them flat on the surface to dry. We got so many good comments. Uh, one, a lot of people are saying yellow frog brand tape is better than blue 3M tape. Okay, good to know. Two, if you take the tape, rip it off the roll, and put it on your shirt a couple times, and then put it down, you won't peel paper. Even with painter's tape? That's I do that with masking tape, but or not with regular tape if I don't have painter's tape. They, they're saying with painter's tape. Okay. Three, this painting should be called the party line. <laughs> and... That's a much better name. Yeah. <laughs> like that. There we go. And okay. Yeah, that's it. All right, uh, Michael. Yes. How can we show everybody our work? I like the idea of you all holding them up and then we'll go to the top cam one by one. So hold them up and smile with your stuff. Right there? Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, so good. Good job, you guys. So beautiful. Very nice. Now we're going to show each other. Okay, show Very each other. Nice. Good job. Great. And then Lovely. you want me to do top cam once? Or no? We yes, did. top cam. Okay, so this is mine. My name's Sarah Cray. Critique everyone and make them feel bad. <laughs> so, uh, this is Beth's. This is looking awesome. It's so good. I just love what happened there. I really do. People are saying it looks like a, I forgot what bird, but some kind of nest. Yes. Oh. Yes. Warbler, maybe? I don't know. Okay, this is Taylor's. This is the bird she was freaking out about. You can't even tell, I, I bet it. you. <laughs> and this is Emily's here. So very nice. She did three, which is great and how they came across, which you can see just compositionally what that does, right? So, and this is a great just way to, to look at things. Just like there is a lot of things going on in every space on here where this one, there's a little bit of breathing room. And the, it's good, it just depends on what you want. So this is where being able to see how other people approach the project is great. If you want a painting that is very active and there's a lot going on, then this is great. If you want a painting where you're like, man, I just want room to breathe for the people looking at it, then know that you don't have to put so much in every area. So great, great job, you guys. Okay. If you line your paintings up, they look like one big power line yeah. section. Oh yeah, should we try? I mean, yeah, you can't really uh, well, see Well, the it. white spaces are going to kind of throw that off a little it's bit. It's just a huh? big window. Yeah, look at that. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's from Ella, our seven-year-old. Ella, thank Good you. Idea. You're so smart. Okay. Um, if you painted this with us, thank you so much. You're so great. Um, share your work. I know it's so scary putting it out there, but as you can see, it's so wonderful to see how other people are approaching the same project because you can learn you can see you can see the saturation you can see the activity you can see the transitions and the texture we can all learn from each other but we can't do that if nobody if nobody puts up their work right so put up your work tag us in it instagram hashtag let's make out <laughs> <laughs> yeah girl hashtag let's make art <laughs> <laughs> Or tag us, let's go make art. 
Facebook is the same. <laughs> and we have, a, we have a wonderful Facebook group that's a very supportive community. You do have to request to join it, but it's quite large and very active, safe place. If you want to start sharing your work and you don't feel comfortable doing it on your personal feed, very, very supportive community. It's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. And that way you can see how what other people are painting and how they painted the project. So will you hold your arms up real quick? Yeah, she did paint on her arms during warm ups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the last thing I was going to say, if you need any of these supplies, um, we have a website called letsmakeart.com where you can get any of the things that we are using here. We have a wonderful subscription box that is very cost effective if you're going to keep up with us weekly. If not, you can buy this single kit for 15 bucks. We have brushes, palettes, paints, all of that good stuff. So I think that's it. I think that's all we got to say. And everyone who had fat poles and thick wires, it looks like there's a lot of you. I like fat poles and thick wires. It's fine. I do too. Yeah. It's a thing. It's your thing. All right. And that's fine. And please be aware, thin lines, straight lines, they take practice. They take a lot of practice. So don't compare yours to mine. I've literally been painting for years and years and years so much every day. So it's not fair. And it just takes time and practice. So you'll get there if you want to. Um, that's it. Thank you, you guys, so much for painting with me. You guys did awesome. Bye.